good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Easy Ideas and Best Practices webinar, which is part of our School and Public Library Partnership series this fall. My name is Beth Yates, and I am the Children's Consultant from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I'll be your host and your question moderator today, and our speaker today is Bambi P. from the Hancock County Public Library. Bambi is the children's librarian who acts as a liaison between the library and the schools in their district. She's coming to us direct from her library in Greenfield, Indiana, and I'm so glad she can join us to share her experiences. It should be good. But before we jo jump into the content of this webinar, I do want to start with a few announcements. First of all, to register for other webinars available from the Professional Development Office and our partners, including one more School and Library Partnership Series webinar on December 5th that focuses on getting public library access into the hands of students, please visit the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov library. For a full list of our current in-person training topics, please see the Continuing Education page of our website. Today's webinar will be archived and available to access and share on the Indiana State Library's archive training page within 30 days. The Indiana State Library has many ways we try to stay connected to library staff, staff across the state. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. Now on to technical issues. If at any point during the webinar you experience any sound issues, please see the Sound Issues box just below the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. If there's a global sound issue, meaning others are experiencing the issue also, we will announce it in the chat box. If you are unable to resolve the sound issues you're experiencing, please be reassured that we are recording the meeting and you can watch it offline later after the meeting has ended. Again, if there is a global sound issue, we will make an announcement in the chat box. And at this time, we are not experiencing any global sound issues. If you have a question for our presenter during this webinar, just type it in that chat box on the upper left hand side of your screen. I'll be watching and I'll get your question to Bambi as soon as there is a good opportunity. And just a side note that because she is at her library and not next to me today, um, please have some patience with us if we don't get your question right away because she can't see me at, or the chat box. <laughs> so uh, she will be pausing periodically to see if there are any questions. And there should also be time at the end for questions. One way or another, we'll try to get them answered. Now, last thing is LEUs. This session is one hour, so you will get one LEU for today. And we have a somewhat new procedure for webinar LEUs. To get your LEU certificate today, you will need to remain on the webinar until the very end, and there will be an opportunity for you to download a PDF that you can then print out and write your name on. Or actually, I'm sorry, it'll be a Word document that you can just type your name into. Um, but again, you just remain on the webinar till the very end and you'll get your LEU that way. Um, if you are unable to download it for some reason, you can email me and I will put my address in the chat box for you now. It's vyates at library.in.gov, just in case you need it. Um, and that is all I have for you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bambi. So welcome, Bambi. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Beth, can you hear me? I can hear you. You're very quiet. Okay, I'll talk up a little bit. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, just double checking. Hello everyone, I am Bambi P. from Hancock County Public Library. Um, there's some of my contact information on the front. It'll be at the end also, so don't worry about trying to scribble anything down. Um, I have been with Hancock County Public Library for almost 10 years. So the process that I'm going to talk to you about today with our relationship. You can't hear me? A little, as loud as you can talk. 
loud as I can talk. Okay. I'll just move this thing closer. And then Suzanne made a good recommendation. You can also turn up your own personal speakers on your computer. Not you, Bambi, but everybody else. <laughs> okay. Are we good? Yes. Is this good? Much okay. Better. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I've been for working for Hancock County Public Library for 10 years almost. And this process that I'm going to talk about today, um, the way we have developed our relationship with the schools in our county is a process that's been going on for five years. So I just want everybody to really understand that this is not something that happens overnight in any way, shape, or form. So don't feel pressured to automatically have all this stuff happening in like a week. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, some, different, some demographics about my library. We serve about 60,000 people. We have two library building locations, one in Greenfield and one in New Palestine, and we have one bookmobile. We serve Greenfield Central Schools, Southern Hancock Schools, Eastern Hancock Schools, and two private schools. So there's a lot of different schools that we work with. Um, in this webinar, I'll share successful ideas for school collaborations and visits, offer advice on how to initiate and maintain relationships with teachers and administrators, and provide insight into making it work from like the public library's point of view. Oh, there's all of our demographics, sir. Okay, so how to develop and maintain relationships. These are the five categories that I believe are the most important. Communication, providing access, collaborating, educating, and then supporting each other. And I'll talk about each one of these um, individually. For the communication aspect, this is where I, this is like the biggest priority you have to communicate. If you're not communicating, everything is going to fall apart. That is why I am labeled the liaison, because I am the school's go-to person. If they need anything, they come to me first, and I can delegate the needs out based off of who can serve them the best. And with your communication, you want to start with the principles first or the administration first because if they find out later on down the road that you set all this stuff up with the school librarian or with a library assistant they're going to be kind of upset and feel left out and they will shut down everything that you're trying to do they won't listen to you anymore after that so our conversation started with the director of library services for Greenfield Central Schools that's just one of the schools that we have a relationship with. We started having monthly meetings, and we really made those a priority. We didn't cancel them. We didn't shove them off to the side. They're really a priority. We're going to meet once a month. In those meetings, we talk about what the schools have going on. So their meet the teacher nights, their kindergarten roundups, um, our schools have math and literacy nights, so we get to find out when those are. Uh, there is a family and consumer sciences class that is interested in having us come out, so we find out when they would be interested. We, it's like a big information dump at the beginning of the year, and then more like updates throughout the rest of the school year. But we still really make it a priority to meet once a month. Uh, we also have to remember that we are not trying to develop a relationship with the schools to replace the school libraries, that we are there to simply support them and take their resources a little bit further with what we have. Bambi, I have a quick uh -huh. question. Sure. So have you run up against any school librarians who didn't really want you to come in because of that reason and how did you overcome that? I personally have not. I did some research um, with preparing for this presentation and it was listed as a cautionary tale. Um, 
where there have been experiences where the school library teachers felt like the public librarians were trying to come in and tell them how to do their jobs or take over. Uh, one thing that really came out of that through all my reading that I found to be probably very helpful is to remember that as a public librarian, you are not going in to teach them how to use a library catalog, um, keywords for searching. That is the school librarian's job. We are there to promote our services and how we can take the school's resources further. So we might go in and talk about the World Book database that we have. Or um, if they have to pick a book for a book report, we might talk about novelists K through eight. Or they can go in and search for books based off of books they've already read that they really enjoy. So it's just kind of respecting those boundaries and knowing that we're not going in trying to do their job. We're just trying to go in and support them and take things just a little bit. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and one thing I also found that we have not tried yet, but we are considering trying, is it was suggested to do like a librarian lunch maybe, where on your own time, um, a bunch of like you just invite all the librarians in the county to meet at a certain restaurant at a certain time and you guys just all have dinner with each other and get to know each other because I read a lot of statistics that said like 25% of all school librarians cannot don't that 25% knew the name of a public librarian oh man that should, that should be a lot higher like we should know each other. We should be talking to each other. If you can't even name somebody who works at the public library or at the school, that's a problem. Um, so really working on those relationships. But if you go on your own time, have your own dinner, it's very laid back. Um, you can communicate with each other, like what's working for you, what's not working for you. Offer some suggestions, exchange some business cards. I just thought that it was a really interesting way to try to do things and so I've suggested it to my boss. Um, so around the same time that we started all this stuff uh, talking to the director of library services for Greenfield Central, getting all that communication going, establishing all of our monthly meetings, um, we our library as a whole came up with the initiative that we wanted to get a library card into the hands of every Greenfield Central student. The Registration for the library cards was included in their school registration. And so once that was done, it was sent to us. The kids were issued library cards. And we took the library cards to the school for the school to distribute. But this really opened up a world of things for the school. Um, our stats have gone up on all of our databases. I mean, Tumble Books is through the roof of the 5,000 stories being listened to or 5,000 times it's been accessed in one month. Um, Novelist, they use that one. World Book, Culture Grams, things like that. Our stats have really gone up because the kids have access and the teachers are having them log in to get this information from databases that they now have access to for free. The, the library you know, kind of picked which I thought was awesome. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, it, it's great. We have it in our Greenfield Central Schools now, and we have it in our Eastern Hancock Schools. And that's as far as we've gotten. We're still working on Southern Hancock, and we're still working on the private schools. But and just an after FYI, five years, this is as far as Sorry, Sorry, I was going to do a little plug. The next School and Public Library Partnerships webinar is going to be about library card access to students and things like that. So we'll have a whole webinar on just that. Yeah, it's awesome. The kids absolutely love it. Um, so that was one thing that really has made our relationships a little bit stronger because we are giving the kids those things. Um, these are some of the things the kids can access. We have computers and internet here. 
all of our junior and high school students have been given um, laptops. Sorry, I couldn't remember <laughs> what it was. Uh, they've all been given laptops, and they come in and use our wireless internet. Uh, knowing that from having communications with the schools, our IT guys have had um, to expand our bandwidth, make sure that we can handle that many kids or that many people on our internet all at one time. Is everything okay with my mic? I just saw a little thing pop up. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you're okay. Okay. I was just double checking. Um, so we're providing them with access. We're providing them with library cards. Um, we have in-library and remote access, so if there are children who cannot get to the library, they can still, with their library card number, access all the services that we have online from home. So that really helps out with a lot of kids who can't physically get to the library. All of our resources, and we're supplementing their curriculum. We're adding to what they're already doing. Um, one more thing that I wanted to add in that I totally forgot under um, our meetings and kind of setting everything up to go and start talking to the schools. I have a document that includes a list of every single school that we service, the principal for that school, what their phone number is. Definitely put down if they are a Mr. or a Mrs. because sometimes you don't know. Um, and the school's phone number, email address, and physical address. And the reason that I say that is you always want to know who to get in touch with. And you have to update it every year because principals switch around. Principals leave, new ones come in, or they even just change schools. Uh, th this school year in Greenfield Central, we had three of our principals change schools. Wow. At the end, yeah, that's a lot. At the end of our summer reading, I send statistics to all the elementary schools of how many children registered and how many of those children finished our summer reading program. And I give them the list of names of the children who finished and they all get acknowledged at the school. But if I know that I had a principal move from the intermediate school down to an elementary level, I will still send them the statistics for the school that they came from that first year because they are still invested in that. They are interested. Um, and that's something they've really responded to. The administration for Greenfield Central Schools is always very interested in how summer reading is going also. So I try to include their superintendents and stuff in all of those. Uh, Bamboo, we do have a question. Sure. Um, Sarah wants to know, how do you deal with privacy issues when sharing summer reading information? Well, I'm not sharing it with anyone outside of the schools. The kids, when they register, they put in exactly which school they go to. So the only thing that I'm sending them is the first name and the last name of every child who read, I believe it's five hours over the course of the summer. So it's just first and last name. It does not have their library card number. It does not have their address. It doesn't have any of that other information, just first and last name. And then I send it directly to the school principal and you know, nobody outside of the school district gets that email sent to them. Thanks. All right. One thing that you always need to keep in mind, though, when you're having your meetings with like your director of library services or whoever your contact person is with the school, they're going to start saying, oh, well, I would like for you to come to your meet your teacher night. I would like for you to come to our math and literacy nights. I would like for you to come to do a story time for all the kindergartners at this elementary school. All of that can seem very overwhelming. It's a lot of visits, and it is OK for you to say no. They are throwing out everything that they have. If you come, you know, if they give you six things and you come back with, I'll do these three, I can get you materials for these other three that I can't attend, 
but I will attend these, these three, the first three. I know that a lot of you have other responsibilities. I have other responsibilities other than just being a school liaison. I order books. I do baby story time. I do two tween programs a month. I do a Minecraft club every month. There's a lot of things that I do just here at the library, and the school liaison is just a part of that. It's all about balancing your time, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So your document of all your principles and all your contacts is very, very important. Um, we communicate a lot through email. Whenever it's in between those uh, monthly meetings, we'll shoot emails back and forth to each other. And if a teacher shoots me an email wanting to know about resources we have for all the Who Was books, I will forward that along to whoever can help the teacher with, that, with those aspects. And then one more thing that I find to be extremely important is face-to-face -face interaction. When you do go to the schools, or if the teachers or the principal come into the library to talk to you, always smile, always you know, have a positive outlook, um, make sure you're wearing your name tag. If you're at a school visit, and you have a table set up, don't ever sit behind your table or sit beside the table, stand up in front of it. It gives you the opportunity to really interact with the children and really interact with their parents. Um, once you can get the children occupied with a craft, which I always take whenever I go out to schools, and it's something as simple as coloring a bookmark, that gives me an opportunity really to talk to the parents and give them the literature from the library but you want them to leave with the idea that the library is a fun place to be. The people there are happy, the people there smile, the people are willing to be extra helpful. And then during the event also, if you see the principal or you see some of the teachers, you know, thank them for letting you come because they didn't have to let you come into their building. Um, exchange business cards, that's a big one. They like putting faces with names. It'll help them remember you later. Are there any questions about that? Any of that? No, not so far. All right. A lot of times, you have to think outside of the box when you're trying to get into a school. Uh, an example of this is we were already going and doing our summer reading talks with the schools at Eastern Hancock. We found out that Alonco was also going and they had been going for a lot longer time than we have and they have their own reading program. So to make it easier on the school and easier on the kids so they don't have to sit through as many speeches or whatever, we paired up with Longco to do one big summer reading speech. Um, we worked it out to where the parents only had to keep one reading log through the library, and that would count for Longco and their Read to Feed program. They just came up with a way to translate everything over, and that's how many books that they read, because they go off of number of books, not necessarily time. So we got a little bit further in by pairing with people the schools were already comfortable with. So if there is, like if the pause program comes in where they're reading to dogs, maybe you could come and supply the books for the kids to read to the dogs. Anything just to get your foot in that door and to start conversations with people. And even if you have to collaborate with other partnerships that they already have, it just gets your foot in the door. <clears throat> Um, there, I also do an early literacy presentation for the high school. I have served on discussion panels for MOPS groups and preschool groups. And the child development class I just think is awesome. So I will go into those a little bit more. Another big part is to educate. Um, your, 
library users, so the schools, the teachers, things like that. We created this document, 10, top 10 reasons to use your library card. And if anybody ever wants a copy of this, just email me and I will send it to you. It's pretty awesome and it's at a kid's level. It's quick and easy. Um, we created this as a living document so it can be changed out based on patron needs. Um, it helps highlight like our brain views. We have tutoring. So this one is for, geared towards children. So we have tutoring and novelists and overdrive and foreign languages. Uh, also talking about for number five, want it, ask for it, and you'll get it first. That's not a whole lot of detail, but it's quick and dirty and they know exactly what it's talking about. Um, we also can go in and show them how to use a certain uh, database. I would absolutely love at the beginning of the school year to be able to attend uh, the beginning of the year teacher meeting and be able to highlight some of our databases to them, show them how to use them so they're more comfortable um, using those databases with their kids in the classroom setting. That's really something that I would like to do. I haven't got that far yet, but it is on my list of things to try to work my way towards. Uh, one thing I really want to em emphasize, um, this is a library-wide effort. You do have to have buy-in from other staff members. You have to have buy-in from your administration. They do have to believe that this is important. I mean, we have had instances where there was a meet your teacher night or something like that at Eastern Hancock and our director and our access manager both went out to do that meet your, meet your teacher night because they felt it was so important to be there. The more faces you can get out into the schools or out into the community, the more people are going to recognize the staff that works in your building and they're going to feel comfortable all around. It's not just they know me and they don't know anyone else. So we try to rotate it out and send other people out, whether it's in our department or in other departments. But having them know as many familiar faces when they come into the building is just makes things easier, or even in the schools. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. I do lots of things to make sure that the kids know my face. And we also had our librarians go to the high school to teach an Eclipse program. Um, I don't know, we're always involved in something. Another thing I do to communicate with the teachers and the administration and the superintendents and everybody is we have an educator newsletter that goes out four times a school year, so once a quarter. In that educator newsletter we pick four things to highlight. So if we're having a book sale, that's in there. If we're having a really big program like Amazon John is coming to the library, we might put that in there. Um, we might talk about brain fuse and pick one more uh, muzzy for the foreign languages. So we would highlight just those four things. It gets sent out to an email. Our teachers have signed up for this newsletter, and so it gets directly delivered into their inbox four times a year. And they know that it's from the library. They know it's educator resources. How did Actually, you, sorry, sorry go ahead. how did you get them to sign up in the first place? That one, we were pretty sneaky. Um, we, the first one, we sent to like the superintendent for the school corporation and really p emphasized like how important it could be for teachers and how we can highlight all this stuff. And you know, it, um, it, they could benefit from it so much. And it was really neat to see like in an hour after sending this to the administration, they had already forwarded it to all their staff. And when it comes from the superintendent, you kind of sign up for it. Um, <laughs> so that's how we got a lot of our teachers to sign up for uh, their educator newsletter. They do actually read it, though, and we try to make it as beneficial as possible. Were there any other questions? We good? Yep, you're good. Okay. But then, you know, we also... You know, not only is the school like requesting stuff from us, sometimes we request stuff from them. We do a battle of the books every year for eighth and ninth grade students. Um, we ask that the schools create teams and 
either their library assistant or their librarian is their training coach. And we have 10 spots that we can fill for our Battle of the Books, and all the schools end up signing up. They come to our library to answer questions about 10 books. We give them 10 books. They have to read them, and they come in and answer, like, trivia style, all these questions about these books. So that's a huge commitment on the school's part. They absolutely love it. The director of library services loves it so much that we are going to give her all of our information about how we do ours, and she's going to translate it for fourth and fifth grade students just in her school and have them do it. So that's something that's become like pretty big as far as all that goes. But I've also volunteered to be a judge for their event if they do it for fourth and fifth grade students. Um, Another thing that we've done is Greenfield Central had Troy Cummings come to their school. The kids were so excited about his books that we had to order extra copies just to keep up with the demand from all the kids. But financially, we were able to do that. But knowing about it ahead of time, we were able to have extra books on our shelves. And that's how we supported each other. All right. So how do you make it look, work from the library's perspective? We all have so many things going on. We all have so many things that we do. How do you fit one more thing into your schedule? And I'm sure that's the big question everybody has. You totally need to have staff and administration buy-in because no matter how hard you try, sometimes you just can't do it all by yourself. The library wants to have a presence. And so if you ask some of your coworkers, some of them will be OK with going, especially you know, they get to hang out with kids and, you know, be out of the building for an hour or two. And some people are okay with that. Um, time management is huge. I have a list of, like, all my responsibilities. And I kind of, through the week, make them all fit. You know, one day I might focus on one thing more than another. But I also know my limits. I know when I've hit my limit. I know when I can't do anything more. I know when to talk to my supervisor and say, hey, I'm feeling pretty overwhelmed. Is there anyone who can help me? Um, and I try not to take on more than what I know I can personally handle. I do the liaison, like I said, baby story time. I do selecting. Um, I maintain the database for Imagination Library, two tween programs, Minecraft Club, weeding and desk responsibilities, and then anything else that they could possibly throw my way. At the beginning of the school year, when the director of library services comes to me and says, I need you to be at all these things and here are the dates, I will honestly sit down after she leaves, look at my calendar, look and see if I can fit any of those in without throwing anything off too much. And when we come back to meet for our next monthly meeting, that's when I say, I can do this one, this meeting, and this but the other ones I cannot do, so let me know what resources I can send to you. Let me know what I can give you that you guys will pass out that will represent the library even though we can do it later. Um, it's not often that I'm able to fit things in at the absolute last minute. If the school calls and says, hey, tomorrow I would love for you to come in and do a story time for kindergartners, I just politely say that I need to have at least two weeks notice or I need to have at least a month's notice whatever you need to be able to comfortably fit things into your schedule communicate that to them it needs to be like a respect that you respect that they have things to do and they can't just at the drop of a hat do things for you but at the same time you have to have those conversations so they understand that the same thing applies to you in your position you don't have the ability to just drop everything and do exactly what they need to You might have any questions about that? No, I don't think so. Okay. But that is a great point. I mean, sometimes you have to say no. Yeah, sometimes you do have to say no. And it, it really does need to be a mutual respect. Because I know that there's sometimes you can look in your library and be like, oh, well, access doesn't do anything. Or children's just gets to cut and color all day long. Everybody, I hear that stuff all the time. But mm -hmm. you need to assume that 
they are just as busy as you are. And you need to have those conversations with people so they understand that you are just as busy as they are. It's just like a professional courtesy back and forth. And sometimes people just need to be reminded a little bit. Right. Okay, let's see. There's your time management, knowing what you feel comfortable adding. That's really the biggest thing. I mean, there are three, what I consider big chunks of my job, programming, selecting, and outreach. All this school, the school liaison stuff, I can put under outreach. We do also have an outreach person who go, goes out and goes to the daycares, goes to the after school programs and all that. That's just part of her job. What I do is just extra things. Planning in advance. Sorry, I forgot to switch to these. Okay, communication. I cannot stress enough how so important communication is. Make sure that you're talking to people. Make sure that you're smiling when you meet people. Um, you don't really know what the schools really need if you don't talk to them, if you don't find somebody to talk to. And usually you can call the principal and say, you know, as a public library, we would love to support what you guys are doing with your kids. Who would I talk to? To set something up so I could come in and explain some of the databases. Or who would I talk to to try to get a library card in the hands of all of your students? The principals like it when you come to them and you're asking them where to go from there. And then passing out your business card is hugely beneficial. And always wear your name tag. So now I'm going to move into some of the things that I actually do, some of the visits that I actually do. This is a picture of my table that I set up at the Math and Literacy Nights. Um, the little strips of paper that you see here, these are bookmarks that already have designs on them that the children can color. This table was set up specifically for an intermediate school. At the intermediate level, the kids could have cared less about standing there and coloring it. They wanted to take it home. So I made sure that it was a bookmark that they could take home. My adaptation for the elementary school is I will bring googly eyes and they can glue them onto a blank bookmark and use a crayon to make a monster that has those googly eyes. And while the kids are working on that, I can be passing out the literature that I have over here that is age appropriate for the intermediate school or the elementary school. I also bring a series of books. These are all new books for the library. So the kids can see that we do have a lot of books that are very interesting to them. Um, family and Consumer Sciences class. I've mentioned this a couple times. This one, the students attend this class. It's like a home economics class. It's like an introduction to early literacy or working with kids at very young ages. What the students have to do is write a lesson plan that includes reading a book and doing what we would consider a process craft with them. So I go and I explain why it's so important to read to the kids, why it's so important to get down to their level, the fact that no matter what they do, those kids are going to think that they are the most amazing thing ever because they are in high school. I actually make the kid, the high schoolers, get up and dance around with shaker eggs to Jim Gill or Scarves, and I turn on a bubble machine and let them play in bubbles. I bet they love that. Oh, well, some of them are totally embarrassed. Some of them really <laughs> love it. But I show them examples of this is a book that would be appropriate to read to a baby. These are some books appropriate for toddlers, and these are some that are appropriate for preschoolers and why they're appropriate. Because these high schoolers are, if they come into the library to pick out a book, they're going to immediately go for what they know. And that's probably going to be The Cat in the Hat, or Horton Hears a Who, or things like that that are not necessarily appropriate to read to that age of children, especially if they're in a group setting. So we go through and explain you know, how that works or what they should be doing. And we also have a rule for toddlers. If you're doing a craft with them, even if it's a process craft, um, if they need to be doing one thing. They need to be doing painting or gluing or whatever, but one thing. Preschoolers can handle two. Was there a question? We have somebody typing. Okay. 
but no question yet. So maybe in a minute. Okay. Uh, kindergarten story times. There is one of the elementary schools that I go to at the beginning of the school year during their library time. And I don't really have a theme. There's not really anything that I'm trying to teach these kindergartners other than the library is amazing and that they should come and visit me. I go and read books that are some of my favorite books. Uh, this year I read them I Am a Frog, an Elephant Piggy book, and they absolutely loved it. And we did a little craft. I see these kids out in public and they come and I remember you being at my school or they come into the library and you remember that day you came to my school and it's just so fun to see um, the reactions on their faces. This year was actually extra fun because my youngest son was in those kindergarten classes. So it made it just a little bit more fun. Uh, the summer reading visits, I'm sure a majority of you go in and do summer reading visits. If you don't, um, what we do is we have a flyer that has lists everything that we're doing for the summer, the fact that everything is free. And we go in and we talk typically by grade level to all the kids and get them super pumped about summer reading and coming in and reading with us and coming to all of our programs. And we really just try to get them to think that we're fun. Because honestly, they're not going to remember anything that you tell them. So we focus really hard on who should you give this piece of paper to? Take it home and give it to mom or dad or whoever your grown up is. Um, and then just letting them think that we're fun. We have a ton of them who come in and see us. And they're like, you came to my school. You were wearing a cape. I see the high school student question in my little corner. High school students, um, we go during their lunch. And we pass out flyers about a lot of the programming that we have going on for the high schoolers. And then if they have any questions or anything like that, we are just there during their entire lunch period. It can be pretty daunting, and it is like usually one person who goes, but over the course of several days. But we do go in and talk to the high school students on their lunches. So I have a question. So when you go in at lunch, do you just set up a table in the cafeteria and hope they come over to you? Yes. But I'm a little bit more um, outspoken than that, so <laughs> I go and harass them at tables. And that's oh, okay. Good idea. Um, anything, like I said, you just got to make yourself go out there and goof off with them or, you know, I, with little kids, I, if they have sparkly shoes on, I always ask them if they think their shoes would fit me. Um, <laughs> they always look really confused. But it's things like that. If you can do little quirky things like that that make them remember you. And then they want to come and see you again because they want to see what you're going to say next. Um, we do after school outreach. So we have an outreach person who goes out to the after school cares, um, goes to daycares, goes to preschools, things like that. And she does an actual story time. And during summer reading, she actually takes them a huge chart they can put stickers on for like every time they read 20 minutes and she takes prizes out to them. I believe this year we had about 250 kids just through the, just through our outreach for summer reading. So we do have a couple of questions. Okay. If you're ready. Go ahead. The long one. Okay. Um, how do you get in contact with the heads of schools without bugging them? The principals seem to be very hard to get in contact with. I have been trying uh, this school year to build a partnership from scratch. I called, I leave voicemails, and I have done emails, but only a few would respond back. Any tips? That is when I would probably look for a partnership that they might already have. Um, like if they have the literacy dogs that come in, or the kids can read to the dogs, or um, like my last one up here, I do volunteering. I'm a read-up tutor at one of the elementary schools, so I'm in there once a week, and they get used to seeing me, um, finding a way to volunteer at the school. And, you know, don't be afraid to show up. Don't be afraid to call. Don't be afraid to, honestly, like I said, we sent that email out to the superintendent, and she ended up putting it out to all of her staff. So if you can come up with something creative and be like, look, I just found this, and I would love to share it with all of your students. 
when the email or the phone call comes from their boss, they tend to listen. Yeah. If you can find like and, an edge there to get in. Um, also consider maybe attending school board meetings just to kind of get your face mm -hmm. um, in front of the superintendent because he might be socializing before or after. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. And also um, introduce yourself to your own board because sometimes those boards talk. Oh, yeah. Uh, get to know the people that are on your own board. And then, you know, whenever you're at the other school board meeting, some of your board members may be there. And they can say, oh, come and meet this person. A little bit more personalized that way. But I do volunteer, and I do that on my own time. Um, every Thursday morning, I take my son to kindergarten, and then I stay and do read up volunteering through United Way, uh, where I have two third grade students that I work with on their reading skills and reading ability. But I know a lot more of the staff now from those schools. We actually have four employees at our library who go to three of the different schools to do read up. So the library's name is really out there. Any other questions? Um, hold on a second. Let's see. Anne wants to know, how do you get clearance to interact with school kids? Lots of security clearances in some districts. I mean, and I would say just talk to the administrative offices and see what you need to do. Yeah, I, like I know for our library, we have to pass a background check to even work here. So the schools in our district have um, ID scanners. And it automatically runs you through like the sex offender website, runs your criminal history, and all that. Once you're in the database, you're in there for the school year. So once they get to know your face, they're automatically like punching you in. But if there are any hoops, just ask them. Ask them what you need to do. So, you know, because if you're like, I'm willing to do whatever to come and help your kids or to provide more services to your kids on top of what you guys can afford. Okay. I think that's it. Oh. Let's see if there's yep, any. She says thank you. Oh, some of the challenges that I found yesterday when I was um, researching, like, issues that could come up. When you go to do a presentation at a school, make sure that whoever the staff member is stays in the room. It is not a free period for them, and you are not school staff. That will cause issues really, really quick. So you need to request that the teacher stays in the room and that they don't leave. Excellent point. Really making, you know, just reiterating that you guys respect each other's roles as school librarians and public librarians. You know, really try to step back and put yourself in their shoes. See if it would feel like you were coming off as attacking or trying to replace them. Because apparently, according to my online searches, school librarians are very scared that public librarians are trying to take their jobs. And so, you know, just if that ever comes up, just really letting them know that that's not what we're trying to do. I'm really just trying to, um, <clears throat> let's see, this website put it really good. Both groups should try to focus on student achievement, not job security. So the focus should really be on the kids, not what your personal jobs are. That's a great point. And letting them know how you can help them versus right. what you want from them right. is another and that all just goes down to communication. Mm -hmm. and we communicate a lot. There's a lot of emails that go back and forth. We do our once a month meeting. Um, one of our monthly meetings, I actually have the school's literacy coaches come along with the director of library services. And so I can ask them, is there anything that I can do to help support you guys better? I may not be able to do it. I mean, I will try my best if that's what you think is going to help you the most, or maybe we can come up with another alternative, but at least it's putting it out there what they would like and what would be beneficial. Uh, 
All right, so it's 250. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, do you want to take more questions or I do you have more, more to questions? Share? Or we can even brainstorm together um, ideas if they want to. This, let's see, this last slide, this is my contact information. If anybody wants to screenshot it or whatever, please feel free, free to email me at any time or call me or whatever. I'm very oh, open. We do have a question. Okay. Paige wants to know, earlier you mentioned an early literacy presentation that you do and a child development class. Is yes. that part of the family and consumer science class visit or something else? It is part of the Family and Consumer Sciences. Actually, um, the Director of Library Services for Greenfield, her name is Lucy. So Lucy and I have this PowerPoint that we came up with together. And it talks a lot about um, like your brain synapses and how the babies have a whole bunch of them until they, like all the way up until they start kindergarten. Like that is when they develop the most. And then it, their body or their brain starts pruning them down to what they're actually using so they can take in more information. And um, talking about early literacy and why it is so important. You know, why are we taking the time to sit down with one-year-olds and read books to them when all they want to do is play with blocks? And then you turn it to, well, how is playing block playing with blocks getting them ready for school? It's developing their fine motor movement. Um, really just explaining to these teenagers how a majority of what they're doing with them is going to have them getting ready for kindergarten. I, reiter I reiterate that in my baby story time. A lot of the parents have no idea that when you're letting them play with things or when you're clapping things out to a rhythm that that's going to help them uh, decode words later on in life. They're going to be able to clap out syllables in a word. It's going to be something familiar to them. Every child ready to read. That's right. Uh, Patty wants to know, what time do you have your monthly meetings with the schools? I do it as soon as school lets out. Our meetings are usually at 2 or at 2.45, depending on what she has going on. I usually work until 5, so um, any of those times really work for me. And it's usually the last Monday of the month is when we have our meeting. We have a couple more people typing. Sure. I think in the meantime, while people are continuing with questions, I'm going to go ahead and put up the LAU so that people can start downloading that. Um, sure. So all you have to do, everyone, is click on the where it says LAU certificate and then go down here to upload file. Oh, and it just went away. Try it again. There we Sorry, go. Sorry, I was oh, trying that's to get okay. it off my screen. <laughs> Um, okay, so Dwayne says, our school corporation has a monthly school librarian meeting that I attend. It's a nice way to stay in touch. That's a great point. Because I bet a lot of school corporations do something like that. So if you can find out and get them to let you come. Yeah, another way that you can work together really closely with a school, schools don't typically have a whole lot of money to bring authors in. So if... Bringing in an author is something that your library is interested in. That's something you can really pair up with the school wherever that would be um, age appropriate. So if it's like a teen book, you might want to stick with high school kids. If it's someone who writes picture books, you might want to work with the elementary schools and make it a big deal between the library and the school. Or maybe have where the um, author comes is to the gym at the school. Maybe not so much the library, but the library can still promote it, and they have the funds to really pay for something like that. That's always a fun one. All right, anybody else have any questions or ideas? We have Tamara. Tamara is typing. And Jill. Loving all these questions. Yeah. Oh, well, um, there should be one spot on the LEU certificate where you can edit, where, and that's uh, where you're supposed to type in your name. So try that. Otherwise, it will be restricted because you're not supposed to be able to type in the whole thing. I'm going to 
put my email address in here one more time. So if anybody has trouble. Oh, the other thing I have is a survey and evaluation. Oh, good, Tamara. I'm glad it worked. So if you want to evaluate our webinar for us, here is a survey monkey for you. Just click on that, and it should take you to the website. And if nobody else has any other questions, I just want to thank Bambi for her time and for sharing all of her great resources. These are really great practical ideas. Well, thank you. Anytime. And like I said, if anybody wants to email brainstorm together, we can do that also. Great. All right. I'm going to turn off my mic, but if anyone has any questions, I'll leave this up for just another minute or two for you to download or ask any lingering questions. All right. Thank you, Bambi. Thanks, everybody. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.